Swayam Prabha Digital India Educated India Welcome to lecture 10 of the course on multivariate data mining methods and applications. The title of this lecture is shrinkage estimation. In the last lecture, we have discussed the problem of multicollinearity. We also discussed how is it going to affect the performance of the multiple linear regression model or how is it going to affect the performance of OLS estimators of the regression parameters. Obviously, if the OLS procedure fails to provide good estimators in the presence of multicollinearity, we require some alternative estimation procedures. So, in this lecture, we are going to discuss about some alternative estimation procedures in particular, we will discuss the ridge estimator and least absolute shrinkage and selection operator that is lasso estimator. There is a problem with variable selection procedures which we have discussed in the last lecture. In the variable selection procedures, variables are either retained in the model or totally discarded. And these procedures often lead to high variance and prediction error. So, we require some alternative procedures for estimating the parameters or for selection of variables in the model. So, we consider some shrinkage methods which are more continuous and do not suffer much from high variability. The penalized regression estimators shrink the estimator by imposing a penalty on their size. Then what do we mean by sparsity? By sparsity we mean large number of predictors recorded, but only a relatively small number or proportion have strong effects. So, we have a very high dimensional matrix of input variables, we have a very large number of input variables or predictors, but out of those predictors only few predictors are going to affect the output variable or only few variables have a strong effect on the output variable. So, your problem is to obtain those variables also which are strongly affecting the output variable. Now, we come to bias variance trade off. You know that the OLS estimator is the best linear unbiased estimator, but still it is not performing well in the presence of multi collinearity. Now, the question arises, is it worth to remain or to search the estimators within the class of unbiased estimators or one should also look at some biased estimators to improve the performance of resulting estimator or to improve the performance of resulting model. Now, suppose we consider this general relationship y equal to f x plus u, where u has uh, some distribution with mean 0 and variance sigma square u and f hat x is regression prediction. Then the MSC of regression prediction is expectation of y minus f hat x whole square. Then we subtract f x from here and add f x here. 
So, you can write it as expectation of y minus f x plus f x minus f hat x whole square. Now, this part gives you u. So, when you take a square, then you get expectation of u square, which is sigma square u. And then you have another part, say you can also write it as minus f x head x plus f x all minus times f head x minus f x here. And then you consider the second term, which is expectation of f head x minus f x whole square. And then you have the cross product term. Again, the cross product term becomes 0, it vanishes because f head x and f x are uncorrelated with u and expectation of u is 0. So, we remove the cross product term or the cross product term vanishes and then we consider this part and you can write this part as expectation of f head x minus expectation f head x plus expectation f head x minus f x whole square. And then you can simplify it and ultimately you obtain bias of f head x whole square plus variance of f head x. If you take a square of this term and since this is a constant, its expectation is the same constant. So, you get expectation of f head x. So, we get expectation of f head x minus f x whole square, which is the bias of f head x. And then you have a square of this term expectation of which gives you variance of f head x. Then the estimators having lower bias have higher variance or the estimators having higher bias have lower variance. So, ultimately you have to tune the estimator, tune the estimator between the bias and variance, so that you can find the best possible trade off there is a trade off between bias and variance and you have to find the best possible estimator. Now, first we consider the ridge regression estimator. We observe that expectation of alpha head transpose alpha head. What is alpha head? Alpha head is equal to z transpose z inverse z transpose y and expectation of alpha head transpose alpha head is equal to alpha transpose alpha plus the variance coherence matrix of alpha head and then you take trace of that. So, the variance coherence matrix of alpha head is sigma square u z transpose z inverse and then you take trace of this. Now, trace of z transpose z inverse is equal to summation 1 upon lambda j j equal to 1 to k. Then lambda k is the minimum eigenvalue and ultimately this is greater than alpha transpose alpha plus sigma square u upon lambda k. So, if the minimum eigenvalue of z transpose z that is lambda k is small then expectation of alpha head transpose alpha head becomes large because of this term. It is much larger than alpha transpose alpha or you can say that the least square estimator alpha head is much larger than alpha in magnitude because of 
multicollinearity. Then we obtain the ridge estimator by minimizing the penalized residual sum of squares. We take R R c equal to y minus beta naught l minus x beta transpose y minus beta naught l minus x beta plus c times summation j equal to 1 to k beta j square. Notice that for obtaining the OLS estimator, we minimize this part, the residual sum of square. Here we have added this part also. So, this part is penalized part, this gives penalty to the magnitude of beta j's. If beta j square is large, this term has more penalty and you can write it as say y minus beta naught l minus x beta transpose y minus beta naught l minus x beta plus c times beta transpose beta. Uh, notice that beta naught is not included in the penalty term because penalizing intercept term implies that adding a constant to each of y i's would not give a shift to the predictions by the same constant. Uh, which is not desirable. Say if you penalize the intercept term also, it means suppose we add some constant to each of y i is some constant say d, then the same constant is not added to the predicted value. Further, we use centered inputs that is we replace each x i j by x i j minus x j bar. We take deviation from mean and then we estimate beta naught by y bar. And if y is also centered, so if both x's and y's are centered, then beta naught becomes 0. Y's are also centered means we subtract y bar from each of y j's. So, we get this model y equal to x beta plus u and notice that in this model all these y's and x's are centered. So, beta naught is equal to 0 there is no intercept term and in this case we can write RSSC equal to y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta plus c times beta transpose beta. Then how to estimate beta? For estimating beta, we attempt to minimize this part. So, this regression estimator of beta is say beta head r equal to argument minimum beta y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta plus c times beta transpose beta. You can also write this problem as beta hat r equal to argument minimum y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta subject to the restriction that summation j equal to 1 to k beta j square is less than or equal to some constant delta these two problems are equivalent actually and this c is the penalty parameter controlling the amount of shrinkage. So, since there is a 1 to 1 correspondence between 1 and 2, so either you go for this one or you go for this one. Now, to minimize RSSC with respect to beta, what we do? We differentiate R S S C with respect to beta and the differential coefficient is equal to this is the expression for R S S C and if we differentiate it with, with respect to beta then we obtain minus twice you have y transpose y minus twice beta transpose x transpose y. When we differentiate this term, we get x transpose y here. So, minus twice 
x transpose y. Of course, that essential coefficient of y transpose y is 0. Then you have a term beta transpose x transpose x beta here. So, plus twice we differentiate beta transpose x transpose x beta with respect to beta, we get x transpose x beta. And then you have one more term which is c times beta transpose beta. So, you get plus c times 2 beta and then we replace beta by beta hat c, it is estimator and we write it equal to 0 and then we solve it for beta hat c. So, this implies that x transpose x plus c times identity matrix beta hat c equal to x transpose y and then we solve it for beta hat c. So, we obtain beta hat r c just to replace this beta hat c by beta hat r c x equal to x transpose x plus c i k inverse x transpose y. So, this is the final expression for ordinary rich regression estimator or rich regression estimator. How is it different from the OLS estimator? The expression for OLS estimator is x transpose x inverse x transpose y. So, it adds a positive constant c in the diagonal elements of x transpose x. We have added this constant. Then you remember that uh, a square length of OLS estimator is much larger than the square length of coefficient vector beta just because of the smallest eigenvalue lambda k. Now, the smallest value of x transpose x plus c i k is lambda k plus c and its inverse is 1 upon lambda k plus c. So, it adds this constant c in lambda k and this makes the square length of O R R estimator, the ordinary rich regression estimator much less than that of OLS estimator. Now, we obtain the bias and MSC of the ordinary rich regression estimator beta head R C. Now, beta head R C is equal to x transpose x plus c i k inverse x transpose y and if we write y equal to x beta plus u then this is equal to x transpose x plus c i k inverse. Say so, you have x transpose x beta hat equal to x transpose y. So, instead of x transpose y, first we write x transpose x beta hat and then in this x transpose x, we add c i and then we subtract c i and then if we combine these two terms, we obtain identity matrix. So, we get beta hat minus x transpose x plus c i inverse, then you have c here beta hat. So, expectation of beta hat R c is equal to expectation of beta hat is beta minus c times x transpose x plus c i inverse. Again expectation of beta hat is beta or expectation of beta hat r c minus beta is equal to minus c times x transpose x plus c i inverse beta. So, this is the bias of ordinary regression estimator. Similarly, you can obtain the mean squared error also. This I am leaving as an exercise for you. 
try to find the expression for the mean squared error of ordinary reintegration distributor. So, you get this expression. The mean squared error of ORR estimator is given by expectation of beta hat R c minus beta transpose beta hat R c minus beta which is equal to sigma square u summation i equal to 1 to k lambda i upon lambda i plus c whole square plus c square beta transpose x transpose x plus c i minus 2 beta. Actually to obtain this expression for mean squared error we take this MSE matrix, this is mean squared error matrix and then we take trace of this matrix and then we get this expression. Now, the problem is how to select C in practice. Then there are some procedures, the first procedure which I am going to discuss here is rich trace. This trace is a two dimensional plot of beta hat R c and residual sum of squares against c. And from this plot, we select that value of c for which the estimated coefficients stabilize with increasing c. The coefficients also have these naval signs, coefficients magnitude and sum of squared residuals and maximum variance inflation factor. So, in practice what we do? We take the biasing parameter c in this direction and then we plot the rich coefficients. So, as c increases the estimated coefficients, the ridge estimators change. And what you observe that somewhere here the coefficients stabilize. So, the value of coefficient is around 0 0.012 or you can plot the variance inflation factor against the biasing parameter for different coefficients and check where the variance inflation factor stabilizes. So, using this graph you obtain the value of biasing parameter c as 0 0.024. Actually the k over here is our c. We have slightly changed the notation and uh, so this k is your c, the biasing parameter. So, what we observe that as c increases the coefficients shrink towards 0. See here, all the coefficients are shrinking towards 0. Then V i f also decreases rapidly as c gets bigger than 0. Then as c increases, V i f values begin to change slowly and then we choose the smallest value of c where the regression coefficients become stable and the rich trace and the VIF values become sufficiently small. An alternative procedure to obtain the rich parameter C is to use V fold cross validation. So, now we discuss V fold cross validation uh, algorithm for choice of this parameter. For all j equal to 1 to r standardize x j so that it has mean 0 and variance 1. First we standardized x j. Then we partition the data into v learning and test sets. You may take v equal to 5 or v equal to 10 or v equal to n the total number of observations as we do in one fold cross validation. Then choose n values of c, say c 1, c 2, so on c capital N. Usually we take all these values equally spaced and then for all i equal to 1 to capital N and v equal to 1 to capital V, compute alpha hat minus v c i using the vth learning set. 
this is the estimator based on the vth learning set uh, and using the value ci and estimate prediction as a p e hat v c i by applying alpha hat minus v c i to the corresponding v th test set. So, we estimate the coefficients for each and every value of c i using the v th learning set and then we apply that estimator and estimate prediction error by applying this estimator to the corresponding v th test set. Then uh, for all i equal to 1 to capital N and overall estimate of prediction error is p e hat c v given v c i which is equal to v inverse summation over v p e hat v c i. So, for each value of c i we compute this estimator of prediction error. Then we plot this estimated prediction error against C i and we, we choose the value of C that min, minimizes the estimated prediction error. So, this is how we can apply v fold cross validation for obtaining the value of C. So, ultimately C hat C v given v the estimated value of C based on the v fold cross validation is argument minimum C i p e hat C v given v C i. So, you get this value. Now, we consider this example in which we again take empty cars data set and for obtaining the rich regression estimator we use GLM NET package in R. Our input variables are MPG, WAT, DRAT and QSEC and output variable is HP. When we fit the full model which is based on the OLS procedure, we get this output. This is the interceptor, the regression coefficient for MPG, then regression coefficient for WT and so on. Then you also get a standard errors corresponding T values and corresponding P values. Of course, uh, the P values of these two variables are higher than 0 0.05, this is also higher than 0 0.05. Now, we obtain the ridge estimator and again to fit the ridge regression model, we use GLM net function of R. So, your first problem is to obtain the value of C, which is same as lambda here. So, this lambda is same as our C. We applied k fold cross validation with k equal to 10, that is, we are applying 10 fold cross validation for obtaining C, giving lowest test MSE. So, ultimately, we obtain this best value 11.02511, and here is the plot of test MSE against log lambda. Again, keep in mind that in the software instead of C, the notation lambda has been used. So, this lambda is same as our C. Now, we produce the final model using this optimal value of lambda. So, we get this final model or these are the coefficients. The intercept term is the same as that of the full model, see here. So, we do not shrink the intercept term, then the coefficient of MPG is minus 3.296526, 3.296526 
the coefficient corresponding to WT is 19.125705. The coefficient corresponding to D that is this and the coefficient corresponding to Q sec is this one. And you may compare all these coefficients with the ORS estimators. So, the coefficients uh, you will observe that all these coefficients are shrink towards 0. Here is the trace plot. Say so how the coefficient estimates change with increasing lambda or increasing c. So, we have plotted the coefficients against log lambda and this is how the coefficients are changing with changing lambda. Now, there is a problem with ridge regression estimator. The ridge regression estimator shrinks all the coefficients, but it does not serve the purpose of selection of variables. None of the coefficients become 0. So, for selection purpose, for selecting the variables or relevant variables, you cannot use the ridge regression procedure. So, now we come to least absolute shrinkage and selection operator that is lasso estimator. The lasso estimator has the ability to select the relevant variables that is why the word selection is here, selection operator and it also shrinks the estimators. Again, we center the observations on input variables and output variable by taking deviation from mean, so that the intercept term vanishes. Then the lasso estimator is defined as beta hat lasso equal to argument minimum beta y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta plus c times summation j equal to 1 to k mod beta j. Now, remember in case of rich regression, our penalty was summation beta j square. Here our penalty term is summation mod beta j. So, this estimator has L 2 penalty, this is L 2 penalty, whereas the lasso estimator has L 1 penalty, this penalty function is L 1 penalty or equivalently beta hat lasso is equal to argument minimum y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta subject to summation j equal to 1 to k mod beta j less than or equal to delta. So, these two 4 and 5 are equivalent, this is 4 and this is 5. Lasso solution is a quadratic programming problem. In fact, for the this regression, there is an advantage, you get a neat and clean solution for beta or you get an explicit expression for the rich regression estimator, but here you do not get an explicit expression for the lasso estimator. It is a quadratic programming problem. When delta is larger than delta naught equal to summation j mod beta j, in that case beta hat lasso is equivalent to beta hat. If delta is equal to delta naught by 2, the amount of shrinkage is about 50 percent and lasso also has the ability to make sum of the coefficients equal to 0. Now, let us see how it makes some of the coefficients equal to 0. In the least square procedure, the residual region has elliptical contour y minus x beta transpose y minus x beta. So, this is elliptical. 
for the constraint region for this say suppose we take k equal to 2 case just 2 variables case then for the ridge estimator the constraint region is beta 1 square plus beta 2 square less than or equal to delta. So, this is a disk you have this elliptical contour and this disk. So, these are the constraint this is the constraint region for ridge. For the lasso the constraint region is mod beta 1 plus mod beta 2 less than or equal to delta. Now, this is a diamond this is of diamond shape see here this one. Then in both the methods we find point where elliptical region hits constraint region. So, you are interested in finding the point where this elliptical region hits the constraint region. Then unlike disk diamond has corners see here and if the solution occurs at a corner the corresponding parameter or one parameter becomes 0. The the lasso has the ability to make some of the coefficients equal to 0. Again if r is greater than 2 you have more than 2 input variables. The constraint region for lasso is a rhomboid and a rhomboid has many corners flat edges and faces. So, in this case it makes possible many estimated parameters to be 0. So, this is the beauty of lasso it makes many parameters equal to 0. Now, we compare these three procedures subset selection, regression and lasso. Say for orthonormal input matrix X, the three procedures have explicit solutions, there is no problem. You get explicit solutions in all the three procedures. Then all the three methods apply a simple transformation to beta hat k. For example, in which beta hat j r say this is ridge estimator is simply equal to say lambda j upon lambda j plus c beta hat j. So, there is a simple transformation similarly for loss also or in variable subset selection also. Uh, some of the coefficients are set to be 0 and all other coefficients are equal to beta hat j. Then lasso translates each coefficient by a constant factor say lambda truncating at 0. This is called soft thresholding. Then lasso estimates may hit 0 while these estimates do not hit 0. In subset selection we drop some of the variables say suppose the coefficient is, is smaller than some value say m th largest then we drop that variable or you may consider some other criterion also. So, ultimately you drop some of the variables and this is called hard thresholding. There are some other penalty functions also say L q norm penalty which is c times summation j equal to 1 to k mod beta j to the power q. In this L q penalty if you take q equal to 1 then you get 
loss of penalty and if you take q equal to 2, you get rich penalty and then there is elastic net penalty. Elastic net penalty actually compromise between rich and lasso. So, the elastic net penalty is c times alpha summation j equal to 1 to k mod beta j square plus 1 minus alpha summation j equal to 1 to k mod beta j. Now, for the choice of regularization parameter c, one can use v fold cross validation which we have discussed earlier also whether you are using lasso or wedge, you can use v fold cross validation. In v fold cross validation, what we do? We split the data randomly into v groups. Say again, uh, if n is equal to v times m, then each group gets m observations. Then we construct the model for v minus 1 groups. So, this is your learning set which has v minus 1 into m observations and we validate the model for the vth group. So, this is your test set which has m observations. So, we fit the model to this learning set, we test the model over this set and then we obtain the sum of predictive errors for each model and then this gives you an estimate of squared prediction error. And we do it for different selected values of c, say c 1, c 2, so on. So, we have a set of values of c for which we repeat this process and then we select that value of c for which estimate of square prediction error is minimum. Again, we have used GLM net software of R for obtaining the rich regression estimator, but we can also use it for obtaining the lasso estimator. In the next lecture, I will give you an example and we can also use it for obtaining uh, say estimator using elastic net penalty or LQ norm penalty also. So, in this lecture we have discussed some estimation procedures for estimating the regression coefficients in a multiple linear regression model when we face the problem of multicollinearity. Actually these estimators rely upon the shrinkage technique. In particular, we have discussed rich regression estimator and lasso estimator. Uh, on one hand, rich regression estimator shrinks all the estimators of regression parameters towards 0, but it fails to select relevant variables or the variables which are actually affecting the output variable significantly. On the other hand, the lasso procedure has the ability to make sum of the coefficients equal to 0. So, it can discard or it can uh, remove the variables which are not so important or not influencing the output variable significantly. For obtaining these estimators, we can use GLM net package of R. We have demonstrated how we can obtain the rich regression estimator using this package. Further, for choosing the biasing parameter C, we can use uh, the V fold cross validation 
And uh, in the next lecture, I will give you an example of Lasso procedure and some other estimation procedures for estimating the regression parameters in multiple linear regression model. So, I am going to stop here. Thank you. Hi, I am Chitwan Lalji, a PhD student of Health Economics under the supervision of Dr. Debian Pakrashi uh, from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Kanpur. In one of my essays, I am interested in understanding the relationship between consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. Health indicators, both subjective and objective health indicators like mental health, self-assessed health, various measures of blood pressure and various measures of cholesterol. Uh, measures of blood pressure like systolic and diastolic BP, you have your incidence of high BP, MAP and incidence of high MAP. And as far as cholesterol is concerned, I have tried to concentrate more on total cholesterol, good cholesterol and incidence of high cholesterol. Now before I go on to what have been my major contributions and various policy implications, I would like to briefly tell you about the policy initiatives of WHO and various countries. The WHO, that is the World Health Organization, it started with a campaign of five a day. That is, you should have five portions of fruits and vegetables per day. That would be approximately, you could say, 400 grams of fruits and vegetables. Now, a portion, before we go further, I'll just tell you what exactly is a portion. One portion is equivalent to a medium-sized apple or one small glass of fruit juice, which is approximately 150 milliliters and uh, maybe three teaspoons of vegetables. So, uh, the WHO went with a five a day campaign, which was further taken up by various countries. Countries like UK, Netherlands, Germany, Norway, they adopted the five a day policy, while some went for expansionary dietary policies like France, Australia, Canada, Denmark. So, for example, Australia, it went for go for two plus five policy in which it said that you should consume five por two portions of fruits and five portions of vegetables per day. And USA went for a policy of fruits and vegetables, more matters. That is, you must consume more and more fruits and vegetables. Now, irrespective of these expansionary dietary policies and dietary propagations, it has been found that only 28% of women and 25% of men they actually meet the recommended dietary norms of five a, po five a day portion. So, the major contribution of my work is firstly to find an association between fruits and vegetables, whether there exists a relationship between fruits and vegetables and health indicators and if they exist, whether if due to heterogeneity in the data, so I will be doing it according to age, by gender and by uh, your weight. So, apart from that, I will go for policy recommendations in which I will, I am basically studying uh, how much fruits and vegetables matter, apart from that, which type matters more. So, for that, I have taken data from the Health Survey of England. Health Survey of England is an annual survey which takes uh, data, which conducts information regularly on demographic and socioeconomic characteristics. You have your lifestyle behaviors like an individual smokes or doesn't smoke, alcohol consumption, you have your sedentary and physical activities and you have various health uh, indicators also which have been collected. Uh, so, uh, before I go on to what exactly is my research, I would like to concentrate more on fruits and vegetables like what kind of questions were asked in the survey. Questions like what kind of fresh fruit do you eat? Did you eat any dried fruit yesterday? Don't count dried fruits in cereals, cakes. Apart from that, for vegetables, they asked how many tablespoons of vegetables did you eat yesterday? So, approximately after this whole survey was conducted, data was converted into portions of fruits. And uh, like for example, three, por three tablespoons of vegetables is equivalent to one portion. So, data was converted and provided to the users, that is us. 
from the UK Data Health Survey. So the major con contributions of my paper is that I found a strong negative association between uh, intake of fruits and self-assessed health, then various measures of uh, blood pressure like mean arterial pressure, high mean arterial pressure, high blood pressure, systolic and diastolic BP and your total cholesterol. Apart from that, I have found a strong positive association between consumption of vegetables and good cholesterol. So, it is recommended in a way that if you want to control your blood pressure, you must consume more and more fruits. And as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact your good cholesterol. Apart from that, I went in for a falsification test. A falsification test is basically conducted to know whether the model that you have adopted and the conclusions that you are drawing are not spurious. So, if uh, a falsification test is done to know, in a way it is tested by seeing an indicator, a health indicator which is not being impacted by your consumption of fruits and vegetables. And then see, we see whether there is significant result or not. If there is no significant result, that means your model is good and your results are non-spurious. So what we did is for falsification test, we took ear complaints and infectious diseases. Now ear complaints like if you are deaf since birth or you have some kind of imbalance, body imbalance, that is not being impacted by your post consumption of fruits and vegetables. And we did find insignificant results. Apart from that, infectious diseases like HIV, A, HIV AIDS, etc., we found similar insignificant results, indicating that our, for, uh, that our results are not spurious, non spurious. Apart from that, we went, uh, since there was a, a lot of heterogeneity in the data, like uh, by gender, by age and by weight. We, can, we did the regression analysis. We found results which stated that as far as uh, fruits are concerned, it impacts a male's health more than a female's health. So it is basically said a, a man should consume more fruits to impact his health, whereas as far as vegetables are concerned, they impact a women's health more. But this has been only seen as far as cholesterol is concerned, the various measures of cholesterol like total cholesterol, good cholesterol and your incidence of getting high cholesterol. Now after this, we went in for a policy implication and in the policy implication, we found, we tried to find two policy implications, what matters and exactly how much portion matters. So as far as how much portion matters, we have found that on an average, five or more portions of fruits impact your overall health, that is your self-assessed health, your MAP, your incidence of high MAP and incidence of high BP. But if you want to have a good mental health, so you can optimize your mental health by consuming three or four portions of fruits as well. And similarly, has, uh, as far as self-assessed health and total cholesterol is concerned, an individual must consume four to five portions to optimally have the impact of consumption of fruits. Apart from that, vegetables have had a very little impact on your health. It only impacts your incidence of getting high MAP and high BP and uh, you, it's seen that only it impacts when you consume five or more portions of fruits. So an optimum consumption of five or more portions of fruits and vegetables are recommended, but fruits have a more impact on your overall health, on various measures like self-assessed health, mental health, your various measures of blood pressure and various cholesterol levels. Another thing that we find is which type of fruit matters. It has been seen that all size fruits, they impact your self-assessed health, your systolic and diastolic blood pressure, your mean arterial pressure, your high BP and incidence of getting high MAP and high cholesterol. But we find that uh, as far as frozen fruits or canned fruits are concerned, they have a they help in regulating your incidence of getting high MAP or high BP, but it has a trade-off. That means there is something negative happening. It reduces the good cholesterol in your body. Apart from this, it, if, you if you have an incidence of getting high cholesterol, it is recommended that you must consume fruit juices because it has a impact in reducing your probability of getting high cholesterol. And uh, dried fruits, they impact your self-assessed health. As far as vegetables are concerned, very little impact has been seen. It has only been seen in case of a uh, uh, portion of salads and its association with self-assessed health. Another thing that they have seen is vegetables in composite, they have an association with good cholesterol. So overall, my research basically says that there is an association between 
consumption of fruits and vegetables and various health indicators. And um, it is highly recommended that an individual in order to be healthy must consume 5 or more portions of fruits and 5 or more portions of vegetables per day. But fruits have a more impact on your overall health. Apart from that, all size fruits, they have a better impact on your overall health, your mental health, various measures of blood pressure and cholesterol. So, thank you. Hello everybody. Now, uh, the discussion which I would try to um, make, uh, talk to you is about the excitement which I always feel and I am sure you will also reciprocate as I proceed and when you do the course is in the area of multivariate statistical problems and multivariate statistical analysis. So, what we mean by multivariate? So, we know that statistics is a, is a subject where you ha have a lot of data, you try to analyze that using different type of techniques like estimation problem, MCMC techniques then forecasting and the area of time series analysis and then try to basically find out the best forecasting tool which you have such that you are able to gain the maximum amount of information from a set of data. Now, in the recent past as we see that multivariate statistics has, has, has really increased in a, in, in a very exciting manner. And if I trace back to history, it has been going on slowly for the last about 70, 80 years, but now the time has come where it is being used in a very big way. And the techniques which we all know, but which are being utilized with new vigor are in the area of say for example, canonical correlation technique, in the area of factor analysis, in the area of conjoint analysis, in the area of clustering analysis, in the area of multidimensional uh, scaling techniques, structural equation modeling, be it in the area of finance, be it in the area of engineering, be it in the area of social sciences, be it in the area of economics, such that you are able to gather the, the information from the data in such a way that it really gives you some useful set of information. Now, in the recent um, past, there has been also an explosion of large and complex data sets, but added to that there has also been a, a commensurate increase in the computing and the statistical techniques. So, obviously, the question comes that if the statistical techniques are there for small, so called small data, not the big data, not the, the, the data which is of terabytes and and, and so on and so forth, where you use different type of computers to state the data. The question obviously comes that are those statistical techniques really relevant when we use them in the big data sense. The question is they are not always relevant, they may not give you the best results. So, what we are seeing in years to come and, and I feel very excited about that is that how the new tools which we have already learned in statistics in multivariate statistical analysis are being redrawn, are being say for example, remodeled in such a way that they can be utilized along with the techniques of computing in a very nice manner that we are able to garner the information from big data very successfully and very nicely in such a way that they are able to portray a sense of information which we all long to have from big data, be it in say for example, medical sciences, be in the area of finance, be it in weather forecasting, be it in transportation, so on and so forth. So, obviously, it means that students, participants who are in a position with some brief mathematical background to take multivariate statistics and statistical tools as a subject in this program are assured are a very exciting future where they can use these tools to, to both gain the knowledge as well utilize them in a very best practical sense such that they are able to do some justice to the information which is given to them and get the best information from the data sets. I wish all the participants in this course the best of luck and I am sure they will also reciprocate the excitement which I have for these type of courses. Thank you.